Hey everyone, welcome back to uh, Unit 1. We are going to move on to part number 2 and tackle chapter 5 today. Um, before we get into our actual lecture, I just want to go ahead and give you a gentle reminder to definitely use all the tools and resources that you have. So I would heavily recommend that you are reading your ebook, you are completing your Learn Smart modules, um, which are indicated by the SB Smartbook icon on Connect. And obviously, as you are going through your notes, if you come across any questions, comments, or concern, please do not be shy. Continue to email me, post them on the discussion session, and if you want, we can always set up a Blackboard Collaborate. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and start perusing um, through Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is going to take a look at um, inheritance patterns, and it will basically talk about the fact that Mendel wasn't always correct when we talked about or when he talked about dominant versus recessive and its phenotypical expression. So before we get into some variations, let's talk about the fact that in our previous discussions, we did mention that when it comes to simple Mendelian inheritance, we do know that there are definitely some patterns that need to be obeyed. So we know, for instance, about the law of segregation that indicates that diploid organisms, when it's time for them to form their gametes and pass it on to the next generation, those gametes will have to go ahead and segregate into their haploid versions. We also know of the law of independent assortment, which means that if you're looking at multiple genes, um, those genes do not have to move in a unison because they could be non-linked or they could be located on different chromosomes. So this was, for instance, applicable when we talked about our dihybrid Punnett square in our previous recorded audio when we were looking at, for instance, the color and the texture of the pea plants that Mendel was playing around with. We do also see that as we learn more and more about genes, that their inheritance pattern and their expression will not always follow the simple dominant versus recessive route that we discussed when we were chit-chatting about Mendel beforehand. So we do see that there are quite a few ways that these um, inheritance pattern can deviate from the simplistic dominant versus recessive. So for instance, we see that they don't necessarily have to follow one simple dominant versus recessive. We see that phenotypes can be influenced by the environment that the organism is exposed to. We often see that one gene can control several traits. Or we can say that several traits can be controlled, um, sorry, several genes need to come together to determine one ultimate phenotype that we're looking at. What happens if the gene is linked and it's located on the same chromosome? Does that then mean that these genes have to move in unison? Um, what if you have a mutation and the allele becomes lethal to the organism? This will affect its success rate when it comes to reproduction. Um, we also know that there are some traits that are either what we call sex influence or sex limited, meaning that if the species is male or female, it will affect its overall expressivity. And we also know a lot about gene redundancy. So this is what I was mentioning before when I was telling you that oftentimes you need to have multiple genes work together to determine one overall phenotype or behavioral traits that we're looking at. So I think what's best to do is instead of just always using like dominant and recessive expressions, we can go ahead and use things like wild type versus mutation because that will give us a little bit of more flexibility. So for instance, on this slide, when you come across the terminology of wild type allele, the wild type aspect will go ahead and hint towards the fact that this is the most commonly seen. This is the most prevalent. This is almost what we like to call the quote unquote normal version of the gene. And it then becomes quite normal that as populations of organisms get larger and larger, that you actually see multiple alleles that can be classified as wild type. And this leads us to what we call genetic polymorphism, where you have multiple variations that can be accounted for as the normal version. So for instance, in the elderflower orchid that's pictured at the bottom of the slide, it's quite common for the flowers to either be yellow or red. Both of them are acceptable wild type alleles. 
When you now have then a random change in the DNA and you get a mutation, what we could see is that that can generate a mutant allele, um, a copy that hasn't been seen before, that is less common, and we don't really know exactly how it will contribute to the phenotype. Oftentimes, the mutant alleles will be inherited in a recessive format, and usually what we see is because, especially when you look at a diploid organism, if one copy that's inherited of the genes is recessive or mutated, it will overall affect the amount of protein that the cell can generate. So that means that either you have lower than normal levels of protein um, compared to the wild type, or you can have a protein that is completely defective, allowing for a new wild type, um, sorry, a new phenotype to appear. So the question is then, why are most mutants recessive, recessive, right? So why is it so common that if we have a new variation to inherit it in a recessive trait? And part of that is that it shows that oftentimes in order for an organism to be completely successful and to able to generate the protein that's needed, they might just need one wild type copy. So that might be enough to fulfill their functions. So to answer your question as to why are most mutants recessive, it turns out that when we look at reproductive success, 50% um, of the normal protein might be good enough for the quality of life and reproductive success of the organism. Or it could be that that one wild type copy, the copy that's still quote unquote normal, is able to upregulate the expression of the protein that's needed to function normally. Let me try to explain this to you um, in more of an illustrative example. Okay, so here we have an example of color formation in flowers, right? So we have our dominant, aka wild type allele, that's going to be purple, indicated by the capital P. And then we're going to have our recessive, our mutant allele. This is going to be indicated by the lowercase p, and it's going to produce a white coloration. Now, what Mendel taught us is that we are diploid organisms, so if these are the two alleles that are available to us, we see that we can either, from a genotype aspect, we can inherit homozygous dominant, meaning both copies are going to be for the capital P, indicating our purple formation. We can have a heterozygous mix, which means that you inherit one dominant, and one recessive, or in our case, one wild type and one mutation. And then you can have a homozygous recessive mix, which is where both copies that are inherited are recessive, or in our case, are going to be defective. Now, what Mendel was telling us is that as long as you have one copy of the dominant trait, you will automatically have the phenotype of purple. And in fact, what we see happening is if we come down here, to the phenotype, we do see that happening. So it's following Mendel's prediction that if you're homozygous dominant, the flower will be purple. And if you're heterozygous due to the fact that you have at least one dominant trait, the flower will be purple as well. You will only see a variation in the genotype if you inherit homozygous recessive trait, therefore allowing the flower to be white. However, what we see happening is when we come over here and we take a look at how much of the protein is being produced that will ultimately produce the color of the flower, we see that the protein production is not the same for the homozygous as it is for the heterozygous. So what we see happening is, is that both copies are wild type, then we produce 100% of the protein and we're getting our purple flower. If we see that the mut mutant is inherited in a heterozygous fashion, then what we see happening is that the fact that we only have one wild type will severely reduce the amount of protein that we're producing. However, this amount is still enough to get us our predictable phenotype. So this part right here, where we're looking at the fact that the protein production varies, this is where Mendel's law is deviating. And this is basically showing us that we are not producing the same protein because we have a wild type and a mutant formation that are mixing together. 
Now, is it possible for you to have a mutant be inherited in the dominant form, meaning that it will be the one that the phenotype will always be expressing if, if the mutation occurs. And it turns out that yes, it is possible to have a mutant that forms and that takes on a dominant role. It is not as common, but usually what we see happening is that if there's going to be a dominant allele transition for the mutation, it has to follow three types. It can either have a gain of function, a dominant negative or a haploinsufficiency. A gain of function means that this mutation is going to allow the organism to gain a new function that it has never seen before. Um, and then oftentimes that the protein that the organism is used to being produced from the wild type will either be overexpressed or be produced at much higher levels than normal. A dominant negative mutation means that the mutant protein will antagonize the normal protein that the organism tends to produce in its wild type formation. And last but not least, in haploinsufficiency, we see that the mutant has a loss of function allele and that that one copy of the wild type is simply not enough to provide the function that we need to see. And because that one wild type copy is not enough to produce the predictable phenotype, we then start seeing some abnormalities due to the mutant. For instance, in polydectomy in human. Polydectomy is when you have a mutation in the genetic expression that will allow extra fingers and extra toes to develop. So for instance, right over here, we have our little pedigree map. And what we can see happening here is that we have an example of a mutant gene that is in the dominant form. And one thing I want to point out to you is notice how when you're looking at this particular pedigree map um, that the affected individuals are fully colored, right? Fully colored in. And this basically indicates for you that the mutation is a dominant mutation. So as long as one parent gives it, the offspring will automatically inherit it. And also what we see happening is that it tends to affect both the male and the females, right? The squares and the circles. So it is an autosomal dominant mutation, meaning that it doesn't discriminate between the sexes. And as long as one parent passes on the mutation, we see it pop up in the next generation. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that in this pedigree, not all offspring is being affected by the passing on of the mutation, right? And that partly will have to do with the X and the Y, I'm sorry, with the autosome or chromosomes, um, which copy is inherited by the child. But one thing that we also see happening is that in, you have that the mutant can actually skip a generation. What do I mean with that? Well, go ahead and take a look at your pedigree. And what you can see happening is that the father was affected by the disease and he passed it on to two of his children. And then what we see happening is that one of the daughters who's affected goes ahead and marries and produces offspring. And we see that within the offspring, one of her daughters is affected by polydectomy as well. So they have multiple fingers beyond the number of 10 and 10 fingers and 10 toes. But then look also what's happening over here. We see that one of her sons, who is completely wild type, goes ahead and finds the love of his life, and they have children. And even though both parents are wild type, we see that it appears in the children. The mutation appears in the children. So how do we explain this? How do we explain that the mutation skipped the son but was able to affect the grandkids? Ha ha. Well, for that, we go ahead and we look at these terms called incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Incomplete penetrance basically means that just because you inherit the allele or the mutation doesn't mean that it will always penetrate or make its way over through the phenotype. Um, so that's the case when we look at our pedigree previously. Just because the father inherited, or I should say the son inherited the mutation from his father, doesn't mean that he actually showed it through in his phenotype. 
So he almost became some sort of carrier. He had the gene and he passed it on to his offspring. And that's why I was able to kind of skip a generation. When you look at incomplete penetrance, obviously we want to look at what percentage of the population will actually show this mutant phenotype. So for instance, if you come across the saying, and you can take a look at this from the PowerPoint, it says if 60% of heterozygotes carry meaning the dominant allele show the trait, then the trait is 60% penetrant. So that means that if you inherit the mutation, you have a 60% chance of actually showing the phenotype. The other 40% is just rolling around, everything's looking normal, no idea that they carry the mutation. Variable expression takes a look at how affected an individual might be by a mutation. So we're stepping away from the whole population percentage. In variable expression, you're taking a look at the individual. And what we see happening is that certain mutations have a variable expression rate in the fact that some individuals, for instance, with polydectomy, they might only have one extra toe, whereas there are patients that will inherit the same mutated genes that will develop several extra toes and fingers. So if you have a low expressivity, that usually means that you have a low level of phenotype showing through due to the mutation. If you have a high expressivity, that means that you have severe or you have a high amount of the phenotypical abnormalities that are showing through. Now, how exactly can you go about explaining this incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity? Well, it turns out that the environment will have a major role to play with this, and we've seen this in many different cases. One of the scenarios that the book talks about is, for instance, when we take a look at the Arctic fox, we see that the coloration of the fur and the thickness of the fur will be completely different if it's in a cold versus warm temperature. So as it transitions from um, winter over to springtime, we see that the color of the fur and the thickness of the fur will be completely different, even though the genes do not vary. So the environment will play a role in its phenotypical appearance. There's also another example of how the environment plays a role um, in individuals who have PKU. PKU is a genetic abnormality. It stands for phenylketurea. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disease that basically doesn't allow individuals to properly break down phenylalanine. Uh, phenylalanine you usually find in like artificial sugars although you can find them in different food groups. And what we see happening is if we are able to regulate the diet of a patient with PKU and not expose them to any phenylalanine, they would have absolutely no side effects or absolutely no phenotypical appearances of the genetic disease. So the environment does indeed play a very important role in the overall expression of any gene. The other options that we can see is that you can have a modifier genes. And modifier genes basically means that they will work together with the inherited mutant gene to produce a wide variety of different genotypes. So for instance, right over here, when we look at our little Drosophila, we see that the little facet of the eyes are often controlled by the temperature as well as the interaction of different modifier genes that will ultimately collaborate together for the phenotype that's being expressed. You also have what we call incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance means that if you have um, a heterozygous inheritance, that the phenotype will be an intermediate or a middle expression of the two homozygotes. So for instance, um, if we look at our color formations, this would be a really good example of incomplete dominance. Let's say you're looking at a flower that has a wild type for red coloration and it has an allele for white coloration. Well, if we are following Mendelian's prediction, then what we would see is that as long as the flower inherits one of the wild type alleles, it should be red. And if it inherits two of the wildflower alleles, it should be white. But if we start mixing and matching these four o'clock plants, we all of a sudden see a new color appear.
and that color will be an intermediate of red and white. It will be pink. This intermediate will be an example of incomplete dominance. So here, let's take a look at our little Punnett square. So we have a red flower indicated by our R's. As you can see, this one's a homozygous match for the red. And then we have our white, also a homozygous max. And when we now separate our gametes, what we see happening is that our F1 generation will be a heterozygous match, right? One for the R and one for the W. Now, if we were following Men Mendel's prediction, then what we would say is that all of the F1 generations, since they are inheriting one of each, they would be able to show the, the wild type allele, which would be red. So we would expect all F1 generations to be red, because that's what Mendel was telling us, right? If it's dominant and you have one of it, that's the one that's showing through. So why are they pink? Well, because of incomplete dominance. If you inherit one red and one white, you're simply not producing enough protein to get your red coloration. But you are producing enough protein to get your pink, which is the intermediate of the two colors in place. And in fact, if we go ahead and do self-fertilization with our pink flower, what we see happening is that since you have the possibilities of reuniting the reds and the white, you now go ahead and generate offspring that will give you a ratio of one red, one white, and two incompletes with the pink. So you get a one to two to one ratio, which is completely different than the three to one ratio that we would normally have when you have a heterozygous mix that comes into play. All right, and as I mentioned to you before, this all has to do with the fact that 50% of the protein is simply not enough to give you the red coloration. So look at this new phenotypical ratio. This accounts for the fact that you have your incomplete dominance. So you'll still show your red, you'll still show your white, but now you also have a third option because of incomplete dominance. So incomplete dominance is when you go ahead and you show the in-between variation or phenotype. And in fact, um, they did some research uh, on Mendel's work, for instance, for the one where he was doing um, his study on the P-shape, and what they saw is that if we were able to analyze the P-shape, that the heterozygous mix wasn't the same amount of roundness, quote-unquote, as the homozygous mix. So, for instance, in his work, he said that if the genotype is either homozygous for R or heterozygous, that you would have round P's. And the only way she could have wrinkled P's if if both parents were able to contribute the recessive R, the lowercase r, to their offspring. However, when we stick the P's underneath a microscope, we see that not all round P's are created equal. So here we go. So we have our genotype as expected, right? Here's our dominant. Our homozygous dominant for round, so we expect our P's to be round. We got that. Check. Here in our heterozygous mix, according to Mendel, because you have one copy of the dominant for the round, we expect our P's to be round. Okay. Thank you, Mendel. And then right over here, he says if you have both copies that are recessive, so your homozygous recessive, then you would get your wrinkled P. All right. Perfect. That's what Mendel told us. So we're following our little relationship. However, if we go ahead and we investigate the production of protein between the dominant, the homozygous dominant, and the heterozygous, we see that the amount of protein is not the same. In the homozygous dominant, 100% of the protein is produced, which allows for that protein to accumulate and the round shape to form. In the heterozygous mix, the amount of protein is severely reduced to 
And it turns out that 50% will be enough to show the overall roundness. But from a microscopic aspect, we also see that the amount of starch is not equivalent to the dominant homozygous mix. And this right here is different from Mendel's prediction. And this right here is showing you how if you only have one copy of the dominant and one copy of the recessive, you sort of have an in-between phenotype in between the 100% and the 0%. So this would then be your example of incomplete dominance. Another scenario that you can look at is what we call over dominance. Over dominance is also called heterozygote advantage. And in over dominance, we see that the, uh, the phenotype is more beneficial in a heterozygous mix than it is in a homozygous mix. And we see this in certain disease models. One of them that's been really well studied is set of sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is an autosomal recessive disorder. So that means it can affect both sexes, autosomal. Recessive means that you need to inherit both copies need to be mutated for you to have the full-blown disease. And what ends up happening is it's a point mutation. This point mutation causes your hemoglobin to obtain an abnormal shape. And as a result, your red blood cells become very sickle. Um, they start to stick together, which means that they tend to not be able to carry as much oxygen as normal. And they also tend to clot up a lot of your smaller arteries and veins. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Let me show you some sickle cells. All right, so here what we see happening is an individual who is homozygous recessive, meaning both of the copies are mutated. We see that the red blood cell will become more sickle in shape, and this will severely reduce the amount of oxygen it can carry, um, so the patients are chronically hypoxic. And also because the cell shape, it will become very sticky. It tends to block a lot of the circulation by blocking your blood vessels. Unfortunately, even with the best care, usually it's a very painful disease, and usually their lifespan isn't as long as we would like it to be. So why are we talking about sickle cell? Well, what we see happening is, when an individual inherits two mutated copies, they have the disease. But if they only mutate, if they only inherit one mutated copy, then they're heterozygous. They do not have sickle cell. They are a carrier. And in addition to that, we see that it allows them to gain a benefit. They actually become malaria resistant. What am I talking about? Let's take a look at this scenario right here. So here's our little Punnett square. We're looking at two heterozygous individuals. So as you can see, both mom and dad have quote unquote one normal, one wild type, and one diseased sickle cell. So both mom and dads are carrier. They do not have the sickle cell disease. And as we can see right here, depending on which mix that we're getting, we see that if the normal hemoglobin from dad mixes with the normal hemoglobin from mom, we have an uninfected individual, not a carrier, completely healthy, good to go. If we see that mom gives one of her mutated versions, then what we see happening is that this offspring becomes a carrier they're unaffected by the disease, because remember, you need to have two of them for you to have sickle cell. So they're unaffected by the disease. And in addition to that, we see that they become malaria resistant. And we see the same thing happening over here with this offspring. So if dad gives his mutated version, mom gives her wild type, once again, you have a carrier that's malaria resistant. Okay, so you have a 50% chance that you can become a carrier and that you are malaria resistant. All right, and you guys know I can't write with this, so bear with me. Now, unfortunately, you do have a 25% chance if both parents are a carrier that one of the offspring will inherit both copies of the recessive. 
of the mutation and will be diagnosed with the full-blown disease. Now, why exactly is this called overdominance or heterozygote advantage? Well, it turns out that in certain parts of the world where malaria is still prevalent, it is actually an advantage to be heterozygous for this mutation because you become malaria resistant, which means that you are not able to get infected by this disease, which means that you have less chance of dying from malaria, which tends to be more commonly known than you obtaining your sickle cell. Another interaction that we see between heterozygous and homozygous is when you start introducing multiple alleles that you can have what we call codominance, which is that you have two or more alleles that have a dominant um, appearance in the phenotype. And probably the best studied model of codominance is when we take a look at ABO blood typing, which is our popular choice of blood typing in the United States. It's based on the fact that you have antigens um, or agglutogens, little receptors on your red blood cells that allow us to tag your blood as either being A, B, AB, or O. Now, the antigens come in very, very in different variations of the alleles. The two that are going to be dominant are going to be allele A and allele B. So both of these will share a codominance. So A and B are both considered dominant. The allele that will be recessive will be the O allele. And part of that is because even though that antigen is still present on the red blood cell, our immune system has lost the ability to kind of read that particular sugar and receptor, so it kind of ignores it as it stands. So in this case, when we look at our blood typing, we have two alleles, the A and the B, that are considered dominant. So they are equal strength, they're co-dominant. And we have our O allele that is considered recessive. So right over here, you can see from an illustrated aspect, you can see the little sugars that you find on top of your red blood cells. So these are your little antigens, your agglutogens. And it basically says that you have your um, allele I, which is your O, is recessive to both A and B. So that means that when you look at someone's blood type, Right? When we look at, um, hopefully everybody knows their blood type. When you look at someone's blood type, we know from a phenotypical aspect. So when you tell people your blood type, you can tell them your blood type O, A, B, or AB. Now, what does that mean for your genotype? Right? Well, if your blood type O, the only way you can be O, since O is recessive, that means that both of your, both of your parents have to contribute and give you the allele for I or the allele for O. So O from mom and O from dad creates the child that's O. If the child is A, blood type A, then when we take a look at the genotype, we have two options. You can either be homozygous, for A, meaning both of your parents gave you an A antigen, or you can be heterozygous. One parent gave an A, the other parent gave an O. Remember, O is recessive. Same thing happens for if you look at someone who's blood type B. From a genotype aspect, that means that you either are homozygous for B, both parents gave a B, or you're heterozygous. One parent gave a B, the other parent gave an O. Now, what if one parent gives an A and the other one gives a B? Well, because they're equal strength, that then means that the child will be AB. So this is an example of codominance where you have two alleles that are of equal strength. And we can kind of play around with this because we can kind of predict as to what blood types will be present in the offspring if you follow these rules. So, for instance, if I say to you, um, if mom is AB and dad is O, what are the blood types that the offspring can produce, right? So, let's do that little Punnett square real quick. So, let's say dad is AB and mom is O. Well, if you're O, you automatically know that that means you're OO when it comes to your genotype. 
So let's do our little Punnett square. And you guys have to forgive me. I tend not to write I, A, or I, B. I just put A. Okay, so bear with me. So here we go. So if um, that is A, B, that means his sperm is either carrying an A or a B. And if mom is O, then all her eggs are O. Right? So that means that offspring number one will be AO, which means blood type A. Offspring number two will be BO. Notice how I put the dominant before the recessive, so blood type B. Offspring number three, also AO. And then offspring number four, BO. So you basically have a 50% chance of having a child with either blood type A or blood type B. Now, what if you have a parent that both parents are AB? Would you be able to have an O child? Hopefully everybody's saying no, because in order for you to be O, that means that both parents would have to contribute an O. And if you know that they're AB, then the phenotype automatically tells you the genotype. One is an A, the other one is a B. Now, what if I had said to you, what if mom is type A and dad is AB? Would I be able to have an O child? Now, some of you are going, but hold up. If I need to figure this out, then I need to know if mom is going to be homozygous for A or is she going to be heterozygous, right? And that's a valid question to ask, but it turns out that you don't even need to really know that because if your child needs to be O, that means that both parents need to give an O and dad is AB. So that means that that O is not coming from dad. So maybe the UPS man stopped by? Okay, that's horrible. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> but either way, it doesn't matter if mom is homozygous or heterozygous for A. Since dad is not able to contribute an O, then genetically they're not able to have any offspring that is blood type O. All right. Now, as we come towards the end part of chapter five, I do want to mention that there's also some abnormalities in inheritance pattern that will be governed by the sex of the individual. And it basically falls into two categories. We have what we call sex influence and sex limited traits. Um, a sex influence means that the sex will influence if the trait is dominant or recessive. So usually what we see happening with sex influence is that most of them are autosomal. They're not sex linked, but we do see that in one version of the sex, the trait will be a dominant expression, whereas in the other, it will be a recessive expression. So um, the example I'm going to give you are little skirts and cattle. Little skirts are like little, they're not really horns, but they're little small growths that occur on the skull of the cattle. And what we see happening is that this is an example of a sex influence trait because you'll have it available in both of the sexes, but in males, it tends to be more dominant, whereas it tends to be more recessive in females. So let's go ahead and take a look at a little table format. All right, so right over here, we see the little skirts. See the little horn growths, okay? And then take a look at the genotype right here. So what we see happening is, is that if you're looking at a homozygous mix, since both alleles are indicated for skurs, then in the phenotype for both males and females, we see the skurs appear. And if we come down here to our third option, if we see that we're homozygous recessive for no skurs, small, um, lowercase f, lowercase c means no scars, then what we see happening is if both genes that are inherited say no scars, then both the male and the female will have no scars to show. Okay, so so far we're doing good. Where we see our sex influence trait is if we come over to the heterozygous mix. So here's the heterozygous mix where you have one dominant and one recessive. 
So you would expect that if we're following our Mendelian traits, that both the male and the females would show the dominant trait, which is the appearance of the skur. But what we see happening in the phenotypical expression is that the males will show the dominant version. There you go, it has the skurs. Look what's happening with the females. No skurs. So it will show the recessive. So even though they both inherited the same gene combination, we see a difference in their expression level based on their sexes. And because you have one that is dominant and one that is recessive, it is therefore called a sex influence trait. Now, what if you have a trait that will only appear in one sex? So not one dominant, one recessive. It will just either be there or it won't be there, depending on the sex that you're looking at. If that's the case, then instead of calling it sex influence, we're going to call it sex limited. So here is a look at a sex limited trait. This is a trait that will only occur in one of the two sexes. Usually this is associated with sexual dimorphism. Um, this will basically allow you to distinguish a male from a female. So for instance, a peacock versus a pea hen. Um, on the picture right there, you can see your hen versus your rooster because it's a wide variety of different feathers and plumages, making it very easy to discriminate one female from a male. Um, in um, us, in our mammals and humans, we can take a look at the fact of humans' uh, sexual dimorphism in the fact that females will produce ovaries where males will produce testes. This is an example of a sex-limited trait because it will have a wide variety, I'm sorry, it will either be present in one sex or absent in the other. So there's no dominant versus recessive. It's either there or it's not. Sex-limited traits can be both autosomal or sex-linked. Um, however, keep in mind that they will only occur in one of the two sexes. Another variation that we should definitely take a look at is what we call lethal genes. Um, lethal genes, or I should say lethal alleles, are variations that will cause um, death to the organism. So this obviously will have an effect on the overall offspring that they're able to produce. So let's take a look at the slide real quick. So the top part says that you have these genes called essential genes. And as you can indicate from the name, these are genes that are going to be necessary for your survival. So they're needed for growth and development. Um, usually about a third of your genes are classified as essential. So any mutation that happens within these essential genes can oftentimes be lethal or detrimental to the organism. Then you also have what we call non-essential genes. So these are genes that are important, but they're not required for survival, which means that if you have a mutation that occurs within this grouping, usually um, it tends not to affect the overall lifespan or reproduction success of the organism. So a lethal allele, as the name indicates, is therefore one that could potentially cause death to the organism. Um, and usually what we see is that they tend to be inherited in a recessive manner. That's what we were discussing towards the bottom, um, towards the beginning of the chapter, that most mutations are inherited in a recessive pattern. Um, I will let you know that a lot of the lethal alleles will usually kill the organism at a very early age, very early on in embryonic development, um, before it's even noticed that the organism <coughs> had the uh, mutation. We also see that there are some conditional lethal alleles. This usually means that in addition to having the mutation, there will be some environmental factors that will play a role in the overall expression of the phenotype. So for instance, in Drosophilae, what they see happening is um, the lethal genes that they might be inherit would have killed off the offspring at 30 degrees Celsius. But if the temperature is lowered, to 22 degrees, um, it's very common for them to go ahead and survive even though they have the lethal mutation. And part of that comes from the fact that the protein is not optimally produced. And as we know with protein, oftentimes structure equals function. So if we do anything where the protein is not optimally folded, 
That means that often these, obviously, it will not be able to express its lethal effect on the organism. And then, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we have what we call semi-lethal alleles. And that just means that it has the potential to kill a few individuals in the populations and other not because of the difference in penetrance or expressibility that comes into play with these semi-lethal genes. Now, a really good example of a lethal gene at works and how it will be able to affect our Punnett square is if we take a look at the Manx cat. So the Manx cat is an example of a dominant mutation that affects the spine. And the way it's going to happen is that if the individual or if the cat entails a heterozygous mix, it's going to shorten the tail. However, if the cat inherits a homozygote mix, then it's lethal. Um, but the difference is, is that it's going to be lethal very early on in embryonic development. So there will actually not be a kitten that will be born. The embryo will be killed off very early on in development. So that means that instead of producing four possible offspring, you really only produce three possible offspring. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go ahead and take a look at our Punnett square. Okay, so we have our heterozygous mix. So you can see right here, we have our Manx. Remember, it's a dominant mutation. So Manx cat, Manx cat. And as you see right here, if it becomes a homozygous mix, then look what it says in your Punnett square. It says early embryonic death. So this kitten right here is never born because the embryo is destroyed very early on in development. On the other hand, if you have heterozygous mixes, then you get the Manx cat in the fact that the tail is shortened. And if you get a um, homozygous recessive trait, then we see that it's non-max. Now, this then means that if I do my combination of two heterozygous individuals, instead of having my normal ratio of three to one, right? What I will get is my ratio of one to two. One will be non-manx, and two of them will be manx. Remember, the fourth one is going to die off early. So you never give birth, or the, I should say the cat never gives birth to this offspring. So that's why we can't account for it. So instead of having a 3 to 1 ratio, you only have a 1 to 2 ratio because unfortunately the fourth combination is killed on very early on during embryonic development. Alrighty, so finishing up chapter 7, um, two important terms to point out to you. The first one is pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when you have a single gene that has multiple phenotypes or multiple effects um, within the body. Um, most of the genes that we inherit are pleiotropy. They're also going to be what we call polygenic, which is the next term that we need to know. Polygenic is when you have multiple genes that will overall control one phenotype. So pleiotropy is one gene, multiple phenotypes. Polygenic is multiple genes, one phenotype. This obviously goes completely against the grain of Mendel, who just said that you have dominant versus recessive. These two terms take a look at how the genes have to work together to ultimately decide on your overall phenotype. We know that a pleiotropic effect, so the effect of one gene on multiple phenotypes, is possible because we see that they can express different cell types. They can be expressed in different stages of development. Um, they can alter cell functions in multiple ways. Um, the disease of cystic fibrosis is a good example of it. It also explains why the genetic mutation can cause such a wide variety of symptoms to appear. And that's because the target cells can vary and their expressivity level can also vary from one patient to the next. So a pleiotropic gene is when you have one gene that can control multiple phenotypes. And then a polygenic gene is when you have multiple genes, 
that have to work together to decide on the one phenotype. This is all about gene interaction. And as you can see, there are lots of variations within table 5.3 that talks about the fact how the genes can work together, how one can mask the expression of the other, how you can have a recessive versus a wild type. Um, so you can see lots of examples of polygenetic, polygenic interactions. So once again, polygenic is when you have multiple genes that work together on one phenotype. And as I mentioned to you before, most of the human body is a end result of both pleiotropy and polygenic genes. Alrighty, I think I'll stop right over here. Um, I will hopefully see you guys or interact with you guys in our discussion section, um, email, and we can do some Blackboard Collaborate, whatever you would like to do. Just please keep asking questions and listing your concerns. Um, and beyond that, we will go ahead and continue on with our unit one um, in the next part of the recording. All right, um, I'll talk to you soon.